Hey everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balkavage, and I'm back for another, with another edition of the Thyroid Answers podcast. And today I have, I have a, a guest with me. This is Oz Garcia. He is a nutritionist, well-known nutritionist, and an author of a number of books, but he just came out with uh, his most recent book called After COVID, uh, Optimize Your Health in a changing world. And so we're going to talk to him about like, what is this thing called COVID and long COVID? And we're going to talk about nutrition and a bunch of other things. And some of this stuff is, is going to be, we'll get onto the, you know, specific thyroid stuff, but really when sure. we're talking about COVID and viruses, all of this relates. Cause as you hear me talk about on all the, on almost every episode of the podcast uh, with almost every guest, what drives hypothyroidism, tis cellular hypothyroidism, tissue hypothyroidism, or glandular hypothyroidism is the excessive stress load we're putting on our body. That's bacterial, that's viruses, that's toxins, that's nutrition. So we're going to get into it. So uh, Oz, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm terrific. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. So you've put out a bunch of books. You've got your new book out, but before we get into the book and we talk about COVID and how viruses impact the physiology, Give, give the people a little bit of background of who you are, what you've been doing for, uh, say, the last few years, and you know what makes you kind of a person they should listen to when we're talking about what's going on with COVID and nutrition. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of history. I think that that would be useful in terms of where we're going with this conversation. I, I've been involved in uh, progressive health. I would say biohacking, neurohacking, to the extent that those words have any uh, uh, meaning to anybody that's listening to the show, starting back in the 1970s. So I actually began by being a long distance runner in the mid 70s. That's that that was the the door, the porthole to everything that that came afterwards. My interest in nutrition, my interest in supplementation, body work, fasting. Uh, um, uh, 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 I would say. Uh, the extremes of extreme uh, extremes of hot and cold, the use of saunas, cryotherapy, ice baths, and so on. I did my first marathon in 1979 in New York City. So that that pretty much blew my mind. The fact that I could I could run that distance, that I had the uh, insights that came out of that, was really very much the porthole to everything else that I just uh, I just mentioned. I had a deep curiosity about being a better runner. And, you know, who the hell was running in 1979? You and I both know Nike was, was you know, light years away from existing. And I would get a lot of my food from uh, local uh, farmer's markets, not the way that farmer's markets were now, and, and uh, began to develop a kind of perspective, a certain mindfulness about what I ate, you know, could, could, does what I eat improve my running capacity? Does it hinder it? Um, does it allow me to heal and recover better or not? So, so I started very early on in the fitness world, in the nutritional world. I was very interested in the work of um, Michio Okushi, who created macrobiotics, at least the American version of it. Um, and uh, from that, I got interested in becoming vegetarian that finally wound me up being vegan which which was remarkable for healing a lot of the problems that I had. That wasn't sustainable. Certainly now that we know that there are many things that have a profound impact on how well you and I perform. There are metabolic individual requirements. Some people may do well on a spectrum of dietary guidelines being vegan, vegetarian. Some people are genetically engineered to do extremely well with a high amount of animal protein. So, so I found, you know, my sweet spot in terms of what works with food. Over the years, I became fascinated with the role of nutraceuticals. I think the work of uh, Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw, uh, two brilliant MIT scientists, they wrote the first book on uh, uh, anti-aging. It's called Anti-Aging. And it came out, I think, in 1980, I still have my, my original a uh, uh, version of it, you know, it's all yellowed and worn out. But but that that impressed me deeply. So over the years, I've become deeply immersed in all the things that have the capacity to slow down and reverse premature aging. How to stay optimized? How do you in a world where there's so much instability? You know, the, you and I both could, could agree on this. You know, that the, the world is as stable as uh, stepping into quicksand. So you want to be really well equipped and really well prepared 
in terms of what you and I are very interested in, what we're going to talk about some more today, and certainly in light of, of what just happened, you know, the pandemic, that very few people uh, were able to get through well. Many people have died. Many people have wound up being uh, long-time sufferers, what are called long haulers, and so on. And so that that is where you and I will kind of more or less wind up on, on, on the shoulders of any number of books that I wrote. My first book was a, a book called The Balance. It was all about um, how do you find the balance in terms of your rate of oxidation, how you burn fat, how you burn sugar, and, and pinpoint best ways of eating for you. I wrote that in 1998. Subsequent to that, I wrote several books on anti-aging um, with the technology that was available 2005, 2010, 2013. I wrote a book on children's health, uh, mainly because I was just real curious why so many kids in the country were overweight and obese. And uh, from there, I've, I've just continued to think about the subject matter of how do, you, how do you keep optimizing your state of health and well-being? And uh, unfortunately, or to some people would say fortunately, I wound up getting COVID. I got uh, probably one of the worst cases ever at the beginning of 2021. And I wound up uh, with severe COVID pneumonia. That led to the recovery that I, I went through and, and the, the most current book that we'll talk about. So... I guess it's frustrating, right? If you're the person, because I've run into this myself, I, I on the most of my listeners and the people obviously who pick up my book and read it will, will know yeah. that, you know, as a guy who's an endurance athlete and doing triathlons in my 40s, you know, I wake up one day to run my blood panel because I just want to prove to myself how healthy I am. And I right. find I've got Hashimoto's and insulin right. resistance and elevated lipids. And um, you go, huh. Uh, I'm doing all the right things, but it, uh, it's having a negative impact on my physiology. And technically, when you took a step back, you realize that, hey, I wasn't doing four hours of sleep a night, poor breathing habits. Those are not the things that are going to be helpful. Lots of stress and down, no downtime is not a good strategy for health either. But it must have been frustrating for you, the person who's doing, you know, exercising, eating well, putting all this work in yeah. for nutrition and everything else. And now you get COVID and you have this long haul, we'll talk about the definition of those things in a second, right. but were you surprised about your response to COVID as a person who's actually trying to do the right stuff? Were you surprised that you had such a struggle with it? And why do you think that is? Oh, it completely undermined everything that I believed about myself. Uh, you know, before I was diagnosed with COVID, uh, at my age, I could literally get up and 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 still with all the problems that I've I've sustained physically, uh, being a runner for forty five years and a marathoner and ultra marathoner, um, that my my joints and ligaments were 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 just coming apart. But 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 that put me you know dead center in in being human, and and there's no escaping that. You know, uh, you, you look at some of the some of the world's great athletes football players, uh, weightlifters, and so on, Olympic athletes in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, gymnasts, and their bodies are just, you know, wrecked. So, so being, being super fit doesn't uh, inoculate you against the wear and tear that, that you and I are going to sustain simply because we are human. Now, now, some people are genetically endowed in such a way that they can continue to perform these uh, athletic, super athletic events extremely well later into life. But, but what I found was, you know, just like everybody else, there, there are genetic gaps, genetic holes that may, may make you more susceptible to things like COVID, certainly in the form that I got. And, uh, you know, we, we now know, for instance, that there are people that, are, that have a super immunity towards COVID, you know, any of the SARS virus and so on. But, they, but it's in the genetic uh, uh, sequences that, that they have. So that so there are people, just like people that have lived through different eras where there have been plagues, that have been able to survive them because they had genetic immunity. And, and what's fascinating, uh, when you look at uh, someone like me or someone like you maybe, in terms of what, you know, how could it happen to us? What, what you find out is that Yes, because you are you eat well and uh, your long distance run, you work out in the way that you did and I had all the practices, 
that that should have made me immune. That's just a a a a, a crack, crack crack of you know S H I T. It, it 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 you you do have to deal with the fact that genetics play a role, and and that's one of the things that I found out. Some of us will have less immunity and be less able to deal with viruses that you know wipe out humans or wipe out animals and so on. You know, we're not, we're, we don't stand, Eric, outside of the, the natural order of things. We're dead center in the natural order of things. We are animals. We live like animals. We'll die like animals. And unfortunately, some of us, you know, wound up in this pandemic uh, being, you know, terribly affected. Yeah, I think another issue potentially comes down to the fact of everybody looks at themselves and, and has their own definition of what healthy is, right? Sure. Uh, if you asked me, was I healthy at the time I found out I had those things going on, I would have told you, yes, I looked healthy. Uh, I felt healthy. Uh, but underneath it all, um, I was, my body was struggling. And we, right. and um, I think for a lot of people that are, uh, that have some challenges with COVID, it, it comes down to, Genetic can, genetics can play a role, but also we have an immune system that's set up to help us with some of this stuff. And for a lot of people, they don't realize that they don't have uh, an, an immune system that's really in great shape until illness hits. And maybe they don't have the natural killer cell levels that they should to be able to fight yeah. off some of those infections. And nobody's checking that stuff on a regular basis. We just assume that the immune system is going to be there and help us out when we get there. And we see this in with people with all kinds of chronic illness, especially with thyroid issues. Uh, people have chronic latent infections and they don't realize those things are going on. And how could I, how could I have these things going on? Because I don't feel sick. Well, that's because the immune cells that are supposed to be helping you aren't working very good. Those natural killer cells That's aren't right. finding those bacteria and those viruses and getting rid of them. Or in some cases, maybe in your case, I would have loved to have seen your, your uh, lymphocyte panel, you know, maybe prior and then to it. And then at, during it, you may have had, a, had a massive immune response, right? An overactive immune response to the virus, which created so much cascade of inflammation. So for the listeners, we've got right. an immune system that's, we need it to be balanced, right? And so if it's underactive, that's problematic. Now we got a whole bunch of organisms that can get in, get in and play around and do stuff and create damage and our immune system doesn't respond to it. Or you can have Absolutely. the immune system that becomes overactive and it's like, you know, they're like blind mercenaries just throwing out inflammatory chemicals and damaging everything in their site, trying to find the thing and kill it. So the immune system can play a huge role in that too. And you can, it, unfortunately, you can look great. You can exercise and not be aware that your immune system is challenged sometimes. Uh, no question about it. Also, a lot of people that do wind up with uh, uh, COVID pneumonia, um, um, you know, they don't die from the virus itself. They die from the immune system trying to get rid of the virus. Mm -hmm. So by that, I mean, in, in certainly in my case, um, and, and to your point, that the immune system over responds. In other words, the virus itself, once it gets in you and, and it gets into your lungs, it's going to cause a certain amount of irritation. One of the things that's unusual about the SARS virus, uh, uh, SARS is, of course, the underlying virus that then you know sprouts things like COVID. And, and uh, COVID is, is, is extremely novel in terms of how it affects you know, human health. That means that the body, that human beings have not, or, or COVID itself has not been all that familiar with human beings. So it can put the foot to the pedal and accelerate it rather than, than live in you and uh, exploit what it needs in terms of getting nutrients from you, getting you to be a spreader. Uh, it, it overwhelms your immune system to the point that you know it'll kill you. Now, now, what to my earlier point in this, um, and, and to your point, what the virus will do is cause you to fill up with inflammatory compounds. And, and as the inflammatory molecules increase, like cytokines, for instance, in your lung, your, your lungs, you're going to fill up with fluid. So, so oftentimes, you don't die from the virus itself. You die from your immune system trying to get rid of the virus. And so you drown in your own fluids. Right, which is which is almost what happened to me. I, I had more than half my lungs filled with COVID pneumonia, and and uh, I remember the doctor that uh, the the pulmonologist and also telling me that I had millions of microclots. That's really fucking scary to hear that. 
you yeah. know, from somebody who was accustomed to uh, uh, running up 20 flights of stairs and I could hardly even lift my, my, my hand, uh, you know, my, my oxygen saturation. When I got, you and I right now are breathing oxygen at, at 21% sea level, right? And as you go higher up in altitude, your, your lungs keep adapting, your body keeps adapting, and as oxygen levels drop. So, so my, my blood, my oxygen bearing capacity, um, we, you and I should be probably right now as we're talking, probably around somewhere between 95 to 100% oxygen saturation. My guess is about 98%, right? We're both excited, we're talking on the kind of ground. So I was at about 68% oxygen saturation. In other words, I really was dying. So my lungs couldn't, couldn't get the oxygen that's in the environment into my lungs and then dispersed throughout my body. So that was contributing to uh, uh, almost brain death. I mean, I, I could hardly think, I could hardly put, put one thought in front of another. So, so you, you can die from your own immune system becoming overstimulated as a consequence of these infections. Yeah, absolutely. So let's do a couple of things. So, sure. P, so we clear up some of the confusion. Can you explain SARS, COVID, and long COVID? Okay, so SARS is um, the uh, uh, original virus itself. So if we look back, at, at uh, let's say the um, avian flu that was around about 15 years ago. It, you may recall, the listeners may recall where, where it took hold in different parts of Asia, certainly in Vietnam, uh, where they wiped out, where they killed uh, uh, tens of millions of chickens, for instance, in an attempt to control that particular SARS virus. Now that, but SARS itself was the pregenitor uh, or is considered to be the primary viral source out of which others spring. So from there, you have the uh, um, swine flu. From there, you have uh, different forms of avian flus that, that have been around over the years and certainly COVID. Now, COVID is, is, it was referred to as a, a novel COVID virus because it hadn't been seen in that form prior. And novel also because of how it, 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 it uh, operated in the human body. Likelihood is, depending on what you want to believe or anybody wants to believe, uh, probably originated in uh, the bat population throughout Asia, throughout China in large measure. Uh, these are viruses that move at some point or another from an animal host into a human being, just like seasonal viruses do. So seasonal viruses, for the most part, you know, typical flus um, that come around tend to originate primarily uh, uh, in Asia, primarily in China. And, and there is a sequence in terms of how these viruses operate. They tend to be agriculturally uh, generated. So, so how that happens is you've got a farm, um, you've got a particular virus that will affect your horse or your cow or swine. Um, they let droppings go into into the soil, into the water. Uh, fish then eat them, and the virus then mutates within the fish itself. <clears throat> we consume the fish, or it's used as, as feed for other animals, and then the virus then begins to mutate. And that's how you get, in large measure, uh, variants within SARS, within all the different viruses that, that come around seasonally. COVID seems to be in, in the bat population in China and, and, and it's ubiquitous. In other words, it's been around forever. All, all bats in China you know, have, have uh, COVID. Um, they're just not affected in the way that we were until somebody chose to eat bats in the way that, that uh, they're part of the dietary uh, 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 food line for uh, you know, many Chinese that that they eat a variety of foods that you and I wouldn't. And then at some point, the virus found the means by which it could mutate and become uh, really pathogenic and uh, expand and move into the human body. At that point, given that it was, it's called the novel virus, then it took off. So that meant that just like we, you know, we've heard these horrific stories about Ebola and, and other viruses springing out of, out of um, Africa or the HIV virus itself. 
these are these were novel viruses that moved from animal sources to human beings, but because human beings had had little interactivity with them, the virus then, like we had said earlier, once it gets into your body, doesn't just affect you like a quote unquote seasonal virus where you get uh, typical symptoms, chest cold symptoms, sinus symptoms, and so on, but it it it, it devastates you. And so what we find with, with COVID is because it mutates so rapidly uh, and, and uh, it is in large measure a virus that takes no prisoners, it, it, it just devastates the human body in the ways that it did with me and the way that it's done with you know, tens of millions of people and the millions of people that have died from it. So, so when, when you recover from it, to the extent that you do recover from an infection of, of COVID-19, you're, you, you know, you can, because of the uh, insidious and, and horrific nature of this virus, I lost 40 pounds of muscle in, in, in a matter of days. I think it took me five days to drop 30 plus pounds while I was in the hospital. And I continued to lose weight while I was still in the hospital. I was in the hospital for three weeks. So, so post-COVID uh, or long haul is where you, you come out and you're you're over at least the the quote unquote worst of it, um, to the extent that that may be true or not. But but there are lingering symptoms for many people. In my case, there are a lot of problems with my joints. My fatigue was horrible for a long time. I lost much 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 of my hair, um, and and the fatigue was unbearable. So there so thank God that I've got the tools that I have and I am who I am. And I, I kind of laid it out on a spreadsheet. I wanted to know what do I need to do to one, be able to breathe again the way that I did before. Two, how can I reduce the inflammatory pain that I'm, I'm dealing with? Three, how do I deal with my exhaustion? Four, how do I deal with my brain fog? Five, how do I cosmetically deal with, with how I look? You know, the, 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 my skin was just falling off me. And, and uh, like I said before, my hair was coming out in patches. So, so I, I knew that this is unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my life. And, and so long haul means just that, you know, post-COVID symptomology means just that, that you survived the initial phase where you got hit, you took the hit, you're over the worst of it, maybe. And, and now you're living out the consequences of, of maybe uh, the equivalent of having been in a serious car accident. And how long is it going to take you to recover from that, if ever? So for the listeners, there's, you know, every at this point, everybody's heard of COVID. Almost everybody's had some experience with COVID. Uh, I think almost everybody's had some interaction with COVID uh, at this point. Some people get almost no illness, minimal illness. I think I had a, maybe I had a headache. I never get headaches, but I think I had a headache for three days. Um, and that was really the extent of what I noticed. Um, but some people get really sick. So we do have this acute phase and the long haul COVID would be the period people that get through that acute phase, but then continue to deal with chronic symptomatology. Right. And so now the question becomes, especially in, in, in the model where we don't maybe have, do we have tools in place that we can measure something to say, hey, this is the virus still creating problems? Or are we just really going based on recurring signs and symptoms since this thing happened? Well, well, the, let, let's, let's unpack a little bit of what you said. So number one is, uh, remember that the virus mutates, right? Like, mm -hmm. like all... Uh, 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 viruses for the most part do. And when COVID first uh, kind of showed up, it was at its at its absolute worst, right? When you had the different variants, the beginning alpha and, and finally delta, delta plus. So I got delta plus, which was uh, brought over from Europe. I forget where it may have begun. I think it began in South Africa and moved on to England. And I was exposed to somebody um, who, who who likely have Delta Plus. So so that's when the peak of deaths were occurring throughout the world in the U.S., certainly in New York City. And and that's different than, than the variants that are around now, which is BA4, BA5. Um, these are, are, are the, the milder variants of COVID. Are people still dying from it? Yes. But they're not dying from it 
you know, horrifically in the way that uh, I may have. And I have friends that did die that uh, uh, picked up COVID when I did. So, so there, you know, there, you know, had I never gotten COVID and I got what you got, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But I got it right at the beginning. And I, and I, I, I think about it. I was thinking about it today. I was talking to a friend of mine earlier about that period of time. It was January 2021. And and the peak of deaths uh, was in February, March of 2021. So I was at Mount Sinai Hospital at that point. And I remember after I got diagnosed and I was in the emergency room uh, waiting to be uh, uh, put into, quote unquote, a hospital room, which turned out to be a storage room. We were out of hospital rooms at the time. Um, how many people were not going to make it and were being put on mechanical ventilators, right, to, to help them breathe? You don't, you, you didn't need that. But but there uh, there, there was a point where they, they the, the doctors and the pulmonologists practically had a gun to my head. They said, we're going to put you in a mechanical ventilator. And I already knew that the chances of coming out of being on a mechanical ventilator were less than two out of 10 alive. So eight, eight, eight out of 10 people are going on mechanical ventilators. That's where they put a tube down your throat. They put you on sedatives so that you don't pull it out and it breathes for you. Uh, your chances of coming back from them were less than, than 20% alive. And if you did, think about it. If you went on a mechanical ventilator and it breathes for you, right? You, you, you know, you're sedated. What if you're sedated for a day or a week or a month? You know, what's, what's your life like? What's your brain like? What are your lungs like when you come out of that? So, so, you know, I, I would have, I would have traded the world to have gotten what you got, you know, a few fucked up days, some bad headaches and, and rebuilding my body is, it was, you know, is the second part of the book, you know, all the things that I had to figure out uh, uh, bit by bit, because doctors didn't have answers. They still don't. So for you, what do you think was the thing, and especially for people overall, um, and I should say, <clears throat> before I jump into there, for the people yeah. listening, when we're talking about viruses, this is like a new virus, right? And so our immune system hasn't seen it before. Um, right. So you, this is like, whoa, we yeah, got to have, this is like remember, a- Remember, it's a no novel. Right. So this right. is something that the body is going, whoa, there's something we got to deal with, right? So you can get a more robust response. Um, but- Overall, why did the viruses become less problematic is the, you know, from a very simplistic standpoint, the virus wants to survive too. If it kills all the hosts, there's no, the virus doesn't get to survive either. So viruses right. have a tendency to become less, um, less lethal, the longer, the, the more mutations they get, more mutations they get, because they want to survive. They need a host. And so they, it's not a great idea to be killing every host off because right, then right. you don't have a place to be. Yeah. But we're all dealing with the same variants as we kind of go through this process and we kind of talked about it before but what do you think was the what do you think were the defining things in your health and physiology that led to you and maybe to others being more compromised by the variant that you got uh, good question I, I think genetics um there are people that are genetically capable of being around people with COVID, even back then when, when it was at its worst and wouldn't pick it up. So, so there are people that are being studied for just that factor. And there are researchers that are uh, uh, interested in trying to find out why that's so. But, but just like people have survived many different plagues and instances where different viruses, pathogens have uh, decimated populations, some people survive. So they've got the ability, the genetic ability, the genetic sequences that make them capable of, of not succumbing, certainly not succumbing to COVID in this instance. In my case, uh, I probably, if, if uh, uh, we were to look at it, was immunologically compromised to begin with. I'd had neck surgery done, again, from being a runner, I had planned out and charted out pretty much how the surgeries were going to go. Who, who the fuck knew that I was going to be put in a recovery room <laughs> after the next surgery with a roommate that had just flown in from England to get surgery on himself, also a really well-known rugby player, and probably bought Delta Plus over. And while I'm recovering, quote-unquote, in my bed uh, at the hospital, 
uh, he's running around uh, unmasked. This is even before there were vaccines or people really understood how you need to be cautious. And, uh, you know, went home already compromised. You know, here I am recovering after several hours with the surgery uh, on my neck and 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 uh, just being slimed with Delta. So, so, so I was already immunologically compromised. My doctors, uh, when I called and, and kept saying, listen, I don't feel well. I don't think this is what a recovery from neck surgery should be, uh, kind of dismissed me. No, this is what, you know, recovery from that intensive kind of neck surgery is. From 30 years, 40 years of running, I pretty much decimated my cervical bones. So, so, uh, so, so everybody thought um, that, oh, no, no, you're, you're okay, just recovering from, from neck surgery. Little did I know that not only was I recovering from neck surgery to the extent that I was, but I, I, was, I was going down fast, having been exposed to a very insidious form of COVID. And, and so by the time I got back into the hospital, I was, I was near death. Two weeks later, being home and, and being told, just rest, you're okay, to the point where one morning I just literally could not get out of bed to go to the bathroom. And that's when I knew something worse was going on. Thank God they took me in. Had they waited one more day, you and I wouldn't be talking. Well, the good news is you made it, right? And right. But I think if we kind of discuss that a little bit, the genetics, some people may have a genetic predisposition that they're they're more, they have a more, maybe Adaptable. a more robust response. But yeah, right. in your situation, and most people, you, you can't change your genes, but we can change the genetic expression, what we call epigenetics, right? Yeah. And in your situation, it sounds to me like it was a more of what was going on in the environment that maybe made you more susceptible. Yes, you may, yeah. may, may not have had the most robust, more robust gene response, but you're in there getting surgery. That's a stressor on your system, right? You're getting a bunch of antibiotics. That's a stressor on your immune system. And you're in a more compromised state. So this is, these are factors. And that's really important for the listeners who are saying, okay, we're not escaping the, the fact that we're going to have another virus on the running around that we're going to have new variants every year that we're going to have to deal with. So what am I, what am, what can I do? And one of the things that I'm, you're going to, you will discuss a bit, you discuss in your book is like, what are the things that we can do on a day in day out basis to help us have a healthier, stronger immune response? Right. Because especially for the patients who are and the people who are listening to this who say, well, I've got hypothyroidism, am I at greater risk? To some degree, you are, you already got thyroiditis, right. you already got an immune-based disorder. You know, we talk about, oh, is it H. pylori? Is it Epstein-Barr? Is it CMV? Yeah. Is it COVID? And we know there was a spike in co in thyroid cases when COVID came around. Sure. The best thing we can do as a, as a group is improve our overall health and well-being uh, that's the best strategy for recovery, but it's also the best strategy to put yourself in the best situation sure. to not have as more as, as severe a response. Unfortunately for you, you were in a unique situation. You had, you know, I don't think you take it the wrong way, but this was a self-induced kind of immune compromise because, hey, I've got, I got a neck issue, right? Which is creating stress on my physiology. That's damaging to the nervous system. That's putting stress on it. And then who knew that you'd be even more, you know, you're getting immunocompromised with the surgery, the, pro, the antibiotics, everything else. Who knew yeah. you were going to get thrown into um, a situation where a new novel virus is in there on top of all the other nosocomial infections Ooh, that you're yeah. fighting with in a hospital setting, right? right? So when you're, for your recovery, you start to look at a lot of factors, you know, diet, nutrition, lifestyle, emotional stress, right? You put all these pieces together. Um, was there, you know, everybody likes this, the magic bullet, but what did you find? Did you find that there was just one thing that you need to do, or did you have to take a more broad approach to look at every aspect of what influences health to help you recover? Look, the, 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 if you look at, at the allopathic model, uh, and you and I were talking about this part of the show, you know, the way that doctors tend to deal with things. Everybody's looking for a bottom line with long haul COVID or recovering from COVID afterwards as though you can take one pill 
that's going to solve everything. This is one protocol. What I found um, coming out of this was that it, it was multifaceted, multi-pronged. I had to learn how to breathe again. I learned. I had to learn how to walk again. I had to learn how to eat again. Uh, all the supplements that I I used, um, I had to upgrade them. You know, to the ones that have a more direct impact on my blood cell count, the ability to uh, uh, restrain any further viral expression within my body. I had to rebuild my microbiome. So that to the listeners that aren't aware of what I mean by that, it's it's the environment in our bowel, you know, all the bacteria that lives there. And, and 70% of the, the human immune response comes out of signals from bacteria that live in your bowel, the good ones and the bad ones. So rebuilding my microbiome, like you said, certainly after the tremendous amount of antibiotics that came in the hospital and all the different medications and steroids and whatever to keep me alive. So, so rebuilding my microbiome, which is number one for anybody that wants to build a good, strong immune response. If you're dealing with thyroid concerns, autoimmune concerns, um, you, you have to have an understanding of the fermented food products, the bacteria, uh, all the lactobacillus or the lactobacillus bacteria that inhabit the human bowel and the ones that you need so that there's a, a, a direct connection and, and, and the right signaling between what goes on with the bacteria that you're reintroducing into your system and how they make your white blood cells, your natural killer cells, um, um, you know, respond to a pathogen that's in your body. We now know, for instance, that uh, one of the problems with long hauling is that, that, that the virus may not clear completely. You know, months later, years later, you can still have viral particles floating around in, in your colon, in your chest, in your brain. That, that, that's, that's, that's scary. And, 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 and so some people wind up developing symptomology, you know, months later, a year later, all of a sudden, like, um, like, like you said, uh, it, it can trigger mono, it can trigger Epstein-Barr. So you can be going along, rat, you know, the, 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 just fine. And all of a sudden find yourself just completely wiped out six, seven, eight months after getting COVID. Um, something's not right. And you're unaware of it. And your doctor won't think to run uh, a mono panel, Epstein-Barr panel. All of a sudden, you, 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 get, you get the right MD or the right functional uh, uh, practitioner or chiropractor and so on, and they do a test on you and they see that your mono levels, your Epstein bar levels are through the roof. All your antibodies, you know, two, three, four of them. It almost looks as though you got lines, <laughs> you know, kind of like that. So, so there's, there's the, the fact that COVID can also work kind of like mm, the, the time bomb. Right, because of, of remaining metabolic particles in the virus, you know, and, and, and the time bomb can go off, you know, months later, years later, you know, unfortunately. So, so let me let me kind of hit a, hit a couple of points there for uh, the listeners. Um, when he's talking about these parts, you've heard me talk about this in the past when we talk about the cell danger response. So cells operate in one of two modes. Typically, they're either in manufacturing mode where they're making lots of peptides and proteins and hormones and neurotransmitters, all kinds of great stuff that makes the cell really functional, like a, like a, like a manufacturing process, right? You need a lot of T3 in the cell to do that. Um, and so we yeah. get a lot of T4 to T3 conversion, but cells that perceive danger are going to slow down their metabolism. It's a defensive mechanism. They're going to slow down the manufacturing process because if they continue to manufacture peptides and, and other bring glucose in and bring oxygen into the tissue, that could support whatever the threat is. So there's this natural cell defensive response. And part of that cell danger response is to downregulate the amount of T3 in the cell unfortunately, it makes you not feel good. You feel tired, fatigued, but having less T and T3 inside the cell also upregulates the immune inflammatory defensive side of, right. the, of the, what we call the cell defense mechanism. And one of the things that triggers your cell danger response is part, he's talking about these particles that are floating around in the bloodstream, these pieces of the virus, these can bind to receptors on cells and initiate that danger physiology. And what's important is this can happen in any cell, any tissue. Um, but there is a, there is a, 
a tissue that has a lot of these danger receptors, it's called your thyroid gland, has a lot of these danger uh, receptors. And part of the issue is when the thyroid gland perceives a lot of these danger mechanisms, it'll initiate that self-destruct inflammatory process that invites more lymphocytes into your thyroid gland. And that's what creates the damage in the thyroiditis. So if you have this particulate floating around, this is how something like COVID could trigger not only cellular hypothyroidism, which you that's that sick feeling you feel, but it could also trigger the thyroiditis. Sure. I want to touch on one point, and if you disagree, you let me know. But when you were saying it can it can be associated with um, Epstein Barr virus or something right. else, for the listener, one of those things that we sometimes I think people don't understand. They think they had Epstein Barr, the virus is gone, and they don't have to deal with it again. Or if they get it back, it's a new infection. Right. What often happens is viruses go into dormancy, right? So the it's immune system helps true. put those things into dormancy. So you get a thing like COVID, it creates a lot of tissue damage, you get reactivation of organisms and viruses. And now not only do you have a COVID, you got an Epstein-Barr infection, you have something else that's, it's like Prince Charles or Ch Batman. Prince came in and, and kissed Sleeping Beauty and woke her back up again. And now you have three, four, five infections going on and you have this response. The things, you didn't get new stuff. Uh, Think about like herpes, like a cold sore. That that right. virus never went anywhere, but you get emotionally stressed, you get sunburned, you get some type of physical injury, that virus gets reactivated. And when you're healthy, it takes about seven to 10 days for the body to get that all under control, put that door virus into dormancy. So I believe when you're kind of kind of hinting towards the other viruses that, hey, you got to get checked for some of these things sometimes. I Is that what you were meaning? Like, hey, these other things can be either you can get new exposures or they can be reactivated. Is that what you were yeah, kind of hitting at? Much. Well, well, to your point, you know, many of these viruses are already dormant. Most of us got, got mono or Epstein-Barr mm -hmm. when we were younger. Um, it may have uh, piggybacked on the back of, you know, cold virus, another flu virus, and, and you're exposed. Uh, many of us know either they had it and they were told to stay home from school or they had friends that got it and, and they came back and they were told that they had mono. So, so mono goes dormant, just like chicken pox goes dormant. It can show up years later as, as shingles, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, mono for the most part stays dormant in your body until something can be triggered. So, so uh, uh, you know, what we're finding now is that COVID can, can trigger the release from storage, from the hiding place of, of mono, Epstein-Barr, and all of a sudden you're now fighting for a, a, a an unleashed uh, 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 Epstein-Barr monovirus uh, on top of the fact that you're battling COVID or the after effects of COVID. And, and mono can decimate you. Mono in, in and of itself, you and I both know, just like you get herpes. Some people have genital herpes. And it may lay act, uh, inactive for years. Maybe they have an outbreak once every 10 years. Maybe they get it once and they never get it again. And But there are people that, that under high stress uh, 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 can get a breakout of, of herpes, genital herpes, can get a, a breakout of, of herpes simplex on their lips, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, many people get herpes simplex breakouts if they're run down, uh, too much sun exposure, Right. So all of a sudden that'll cause a breakout on your lip. So just like that, all these viruses, we're 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 repositories for different viruses that are living in us and laying dormant. So so what COVID can do is because of its you know unbelievable suppressive effect on immune function, will will allow the escape, the different portholes through which mono, quote unquote, Epstein Barr, can then escape from where it's sequestered and then bloom and then blow your body apart too. So now you're dealing with 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 a very complex immunological uh, catastrophe. Right. And so when we're thinking about if somebody's saying, listen, I, I feel I, I've had COVID, I thought I recovered, I'm still tired, I'm still fatigued, I still don't feel well, my joints ache. What should they, what are their, what do you recommend from a, testing perspective is there anything particular that somebody sh should clue somebody in that what they might be dealing with is a chronic covid infection 
Sure. Well, well, of course, you and I both know that you can test um, your uh, um, antibodies on a standard blood test, number one, for COVID, for any number of these latent diseases that, that viruses that lay in our biot quiescent, uh, they may never erupt or, or they may. So you can get very comprehensive blood panels. I lay this out in my book also um, in the second part of the book. But the, the book breaks down into two parts. One is my story. And secondarily is, you know, my recovery, how I did it, what are all the protocols. Diagnostics are critical. So you want to find a good doctor that's going to do the right blood test. It's going to look at all your immune panels, right? And then look for different viruses that may lay uh, uh, in dormancy. Mono, Epstein-Barr, uh, cytomegalovirus, um, any number of herpes space viruses, HPV, herpes simplex, blah, and, 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 and get a good, good idea of what it is that you're harboring, right? So you can see if anything's been erupted or triggered by the, the initial COVID uh, uh, reaction. I, I've seen people uh, that, that got COVID and wound up, you know, with a horrific shingles outbreak afterwards, you know, or, or you know, terrible outbreak of, of, you know, canker sores and so on. In other words, secondary infections that typically would not show up, show up as your immune system is being blown apart. So a very comprehensive immune panel, viral panel, and so then, explain the immune panel because most people would it, explain the immune panel when you're saying immune panel because most people wouldn't know what that means. So if they're gonna, obviously they can get the book and they can read through it. But sure. give some, are you, give some an idea of what they should be thinking about from an immune panel because listen, I run hundreds and hundreds of lab panels every year, sure. but and I look at hundreds of lab panels from other physicians and barely anybody gets an inflammatory test done before no, they meet no. me or an immune panel done. So when you talk about immune panel, what are just maybe a few tests that somebody might uh, be thinking they should be looking for if their doctor is going to run an immune panel? Right. Uh, you, you're definitely going to want to look at uh, whether or not the uh, primary virus COVID may have triggered uh, thyroiditis. Right, so you you and I want to get a very comprehensive uh, autoimmune panel, right? Uh, anti nuclear antibody, ANA. Uh, uh, that's going to tell you right away if, if by some catastrophe the virus is triggered, your immune system to now begin to attack you and attack your thyroid, different parts of your body. Um, um, so you can all I, I would do I would do antibodies for everything, thyroid antibodies. Uh, you and I both know that that's critical, regardless. But 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 if you're if you're wiped out and you're not getting your energy back, you want to make sure that you're getting an, a, a test that's going to look at when I when we're talking to get about about uh, an, an immune panel, uh, autoimmune antibodies, antibodies for your thyroid, um, uh, uh, arthritis antibodies like the, like the, like rheumatoid arthritis antibodies. In other words, I would literally go through the list of anything at all that may be indicative of the fact that your immune system is now not functioning like it should, and it's turning on itself, and it's now creating autoimmune problems. That's where your immune system is turned in on yourself. And that can be triggered by getting something as severe as COVID. So, 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 so you wanna look very carefully, not only at whether or not you've got sequestered viruses, you wanna do all the viral panels very carefully, but you wanna look at how your immune system is functioning. So there you're going to look at autoimmune panels, white blood cell panels, uh, 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 everything everything that may indicate that your immune system is either continuing to work well or not, and whether and and, and maybe it's turned in on you. You wanna you wanna get that right off the top. My my thyroid uh, antibodies actually went up for a while. My TPO uh, um, um, and the other one you'll remind me in a second. Both of those shot in the first several months of 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 uh, you know being infected with COVID, Eric, it was just it blew my mind. But, so, but it looked like it looked like my immune system was turning on my thyroid. Yeah, so I'll add a couple things to that. One is there's a there's a great lab called Cyrex Labs that actually has a, a new panel that they developed through COVID which was called the, the lymphocyte panel. And so for the listeners, if you want to find out like what's happening with your immune system, this panel breaks down what are called your T cells. So it looks at your natural killer cells, too high, normal, too low. It looks at the different 
uh, types of T cells uh, to be able to figure out like what fa what's going on with your T cell population. So it looks like white cells, your B cells, and your T different types of T cells. And that's a great test for for someone who knows how to interpret that test to really Very get an cool. idea of what's going on with the physiology. Um, what's that? Critical. Yeah. And so there are things nutritionally based on when we see that, obviously, if we there's things that we can help shift that immune system a little bit, if it's TH1, TH2 dominant, CD8, CD4, shift those things a little bit nutritionally, but it helps us understand do we still have some, do we have an appropriate or inappropriate response and maybe make a better idea as to the way, right way to help somebody. So that's a great right. test. And that lab also does a whole bunch of antibody panels. If you want to see uh, what tissues might already be undergoing some damage and whether the antibodies actually create the damage or the virus is actually creating the damage is up to, for some controversy. Uh, the, my listeners have heard me discuss this before. You know, I, grew up learning that the, the TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies were like little Pac-Man eating away the thyroid gland. But yeah. the most recent literature says that they don't really cause, T thyroglobulin antibodies cause no damage to the thyroid gland and TPO antibodies cause very little damage to the gland. It's the w infiltrating white cells that create an inflammation right. that actually creates all the damage. And those antibodies are more indicators, uh, either they're predictive antibodies of which tissues might be, become more damaged, or they're indicators of tissues that are already potentially starting to be damaged by tissues. So there's multiple right. uh, thoughts there, but just an interesting point. So we've got a, um, we've, I guess this is a question, maybe controversial. I'm going to ask you anyway. You don't have to answer it if you don't want, okay. but somebody might be listening to this. And so we're, now we're bombarded. We've got tons of vaccines. We got tons of boosters that are out there now. Um, where everybody's got different opinions. Where do you stand? Is the, should we put more time and attention towards vaccines and boosters, or should we put more time and attention towards looking at ourselves and saying, Hey, what can I do to make this physiology more optimized so that I have a stronger immune system and I'm less likely to get compromised. Um, um, you're gonna, uh, so this, this is going to sound uh, ridiculous. That's a good question. <laughs> right. Um, um, I, I, I think that the question of being vaccinated and getting boosters is, is obviously very personal. You know, these are choices people need to make. I, I wish to God that I would have the vaccine would have been available when when I got sick. I was two weeks away from being able to get a vaccine. I I, I could never ever wish what occurred to me on anybody. And if and if there's a liability to vaccine as opposed to, to what happened to me, I I they, 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 it's like what are you talking about? You got to get the fucking vaccine. You know if you'd seen what I look like and and the fact that. I was I was literally losing my mind. I was traumatized, PTSD. You know, life was horrible. I wanted to die when I got out of the hospital. And thank God that I've got the mental uh, resourcefulness and the capacity to, uh, you know, have come through what I came through. But there was no question in my mind that given the choice at that point, if I knew on the one hand, listen, Ozzy, you're going to wind up three weeks in the hospital dying and and you're going to lose 45 pounds of your muscle weight and lose most of your hair and you're going to age prematurely you know x number of years and and lose your will to live you know to love to care all the things that that matter to me as a human being i stopped caring i i i don't even know how to say it not like i stopped care i just stopped caring there was i i was emotionally devoid and if the option was to get a vaccine with all the liabilities that people say came with it, you know, th there was no question in my mind. So, so I'm biased in that regard. And I think that, uh, uh, but actually when I got my second vaccine, I, I improved dramatically. You know, it was like people were telling me, you can't get the second one. You know, th this is personal. I was having gone through what I went through and I've been in these debates with many people um, and and I choose to back off of 
uh, this kind of interaction with many people, especially people that are pro ivermectin and uh, uh, other other uh, quote unquote approaches to dealing with COVID, it's kind of like look, take your chances. I know plenty of people that took ivermectin and got sick and got horribly sick. Now people that took ivermectin and got sick off ivermectin. Then on top of that, they got COVID anyway. And and the evidence to this day is still you know impoverished when it comes to whether ivermectin works well or not or uh, you know, sw you know, swigging chlorine and crap like that. That in in the end, uh, what we're finding is an acceleration now in terms of the vaccines that are coming out, the boosters that are coming out and becoming available. And you you got to make the choices on your own. Um, but you gotta you gotta be a thoughtful human being. I've got friends that I debate this with that have debated this with me, and would not get the vaccine, and they wound up horrifically sick also. Um, you know, so 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 you know, it's it's a complicated question, but you know, for me personally, there's no 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 debate. So you're, I mean, the and the con the argument to that is is that we don't know that if you had gotten the virus or the vaccine, that you still wouldn't have gotten sick, sure. right? Sure, but but uh, based on the data that's available, what we're finding is that people that have got vaccines and got COVID. They didn't wind up anywhere as near where I was. I mean, I had two people die on me in the hospital, you know, within a matter of three weeks. I had two roommates. One died, you know, the first week, one died the second. Uh, another one lost his, his mind completely. Um, 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 and 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 the the horrific uh, 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 series of events that I went through, if if that could have all been prevented, being in the hospital uh, by a vaccine. And 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 avoided, you know, living in 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 the modern in the modern world's version of being uh, uh, on a ship of fools. There's no question that that I would have done the vaccine. So we can't expect that the vaccines are going to be the thing that's that saves us that's going correct. forward with everything else. You have and to we have you have to build your immune capacity. You have to eat. You know, in the ways that you and I both are that that uh, uh, will support a strong immune system, a robust immune system, a robust brain, your ability to deal with pathogens. You have to take uh, probiotics, prebiotics, postbiotics, and build up you know a very powerful immune response in your colon. You have to take and use, uh, and I lay this out in the book, the different kinds of of nutraceuticals. Uh, peptides that actually mimic immune system function, and 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 uh, you know your your best superpower is sleep. You got to sleep. You got to get adequate amount of sleep. You have to have ways to measure it. You know, I think the both of us are wearing our aura ring. So you, you you gotta you gotta quantify all the things that you're doing so that you know that that the likelihood of you going down bad now. Is is taking close to you know percentage points. Nothing in the way that it was at the beginning of of the COVID outbreak. Yeah, so you know, every, there's going to be another boogeyman coming around the, the corner soon, right? There's going to be another oh, yeah. virus, something else. So for the listener, whether you have a thyroid condition or you have a GI condition or you have uh, high blood pressure or you have cholesterol issues, ultimately, what creates a compromised immune system is the chronic burden from our diet, our nutrition, our disrupted sleep, our Correct. disordered breathing. And these are almost all the things that uh, disrupt our health and tear our health down and compromise our immune system are things that revolve around diet, nutrition, and lifestyle. And yeah. so without spending a dollar on a functional medicine practitioner and nutritionist, you could start working on improving your respiration, right? Simple correct. tests you can do. You That's can correct. work on improving your sleep quality. You can improve your nutrition. Uh, you can improve your physical fitness, right? There's a balance. There's what they call a hermetic curve, right? So too right. little stress on the system is not good and too much stress on the system is not good. We right. need some stress. We need to be taxed and challenged, but then we need to work through recovery. So what I'd like to do in the last couple minutes, few minutes that we have is just talk about what I, in my book, I wrote about the fitness factors, the aspects 
of diet, lifestyle, new, and nutrition that yeah. influence our health. So I'd like to ask you, maybe you can give a little tidbit of recommendation for somebody how to improve their health and well-being in each one of these adult different categories. Just something quick, and we'll kind of walk through these in, in a way to finish, finish up, and then we'll tell Absolutely. people where they can get the book yeah. and hear more about you. But nutrition and diet is a great place to start. And in today's world, um, we have a problem, especially in this functional medicine space, where we've circled the wagons and we're shooting in. The vegans are blaming the carnivores. The carnivores are blaming the paleos. The paleos are blaming the, the vegetarians. The vegetarians are blaming the, you know, the whatever the next thing is. Um, I, I think it's ridiculous that we're, we're circled the wagons and shooting in. Uh, instead of circling the wagons and shooting again out against the the high processed food interest industry, which is where the real issues lie, what's your take on nutrition and diet? And what do you think is a, just a very good, simple strategy that somebody can utilize to improve their health and well being? Um, let so let's kind of uh, put an outline together very quickly. Uh, of of things that people need to attend to, right? So one is uh, qual you know a, a, a qualitative way of eating, and that's to be determined. You can determine that uh, um, by doing a gene test. You know any number of gene tests that will pinpoint with greater accuracy what's going to work best for you in terms of should you be vegan, should you be vegetarian, should be, should you be paleo, should you be keto, should you be carnivore, should you be Mediterranean. So I tend to eat a combination of classical Mediterranean and Asian. So I, I and, and based on most studies, um, that seems to pan out really well. So I follow what we would call ancestral dietary eating habits. Um, I have a substantial amount of lean protein, primarily fish, seafood, some poultry, a huge amount of plant-based products. I don't eat a lot of lectin-rich food like uh, wheat, uh, uh, wheat-based products, a lot of grains. My grains tend to be, for the most part, rice and rice-based. Um, um, tremendous amount of, of uh, fruit, and they tend to be those that are high in polyphenols, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries. And and um, I do have my days where I, I'm strictly vegetarian. So so by that, I'm, I'm what I'm doing is I'm following, again, ancestral dietary guidelines. You know, if you were a hunter-gatherer 20, 30,000 years ago, there would be days where you would you wouldn't eat protein just because there's nothing to to kill hunt or eat. So you would you would eat what you know low hanging fruit, whatever was available that you could tear out of the ground and eat until you could get a nice piece of of protein by some antelope you would kill. Um, um, so in that way, uh, uh, I also underfeed. I do have uh, periods where I don't eat. I, I I do 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 days of fasting or intermittent fasting, which everybody should do. To give your colon a break, your kidneys a break, your whole body a break. Intermittent fasting is the key to salvation um, for people that don't have the patience to do lengthier fast. Sleep is critical. I think that unless you and I have that kind of carved out properly, you're going to suffer. Your immune system is going to suffer a lot. Uh, being fit, uh, I, I don't run the way that I used to. Uh, there, there, there are liabilities at my age for trying to run marathons, triathlons, the way that I used to. But, but I do work out with bands. So you need to, you need to do something physical every single day. Um, being mindful. So, so having a meditative practice, I think, is central. You know, I use different apps and different devices. I use a Muse, uh, 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 a Muse 2. Uh, uh, you know, for the listeners, that's a device that allows you to go into deep states of meditation. And, and it really teaches you how to be a mindful human being. It's very inexpensive. You get a Muse uh, kit on Amazon, buy it directly from uh, Muse Online, M-U-S-E. Um, getting body work. So I get acupuncture, deep tissue body work at least once a week, maybe more. Uh, you need to be outdoors. You need to get light. So even on a winter day, I'll walk early in the morning with my dog. You need to expose your face and your eyes to at least 20 minutes of sunlight every day. If not, I have a pair of glasses that mimics daylight that I'll put on in the morning if I can't get out for about 20 minutes every day. Uh, um, um, respiration yeah i was thinking about that uh you need you, everybody needs to do breathing exercises 
I, 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 I wanted to see. You, you need to, you, you, I'll do about 40 minutes of breathing exercise every morning. I use a breathing device. There are different ones that I have um, that I use to actually bring my lungs back to normal. This is a very simple one. It's called Breathe Easy. Uh, you can get this on Amazon. It looks like a little uh, tennis uh, uh, badminton uh, device. Shot, but, yeah, shuttlecock. Correct. So, so I do a very intense breathing exercise every day. Sauna is a critical. Extreme heat, hot baths uh, most evenings. If you can't get to a sauna, extreme cold. They do cold plunges several times a week. I'll do cryotherapy. So extremes of heat and cold. So you and I could keep expanding on that list, but I think I've laid out the uh, sweet spots in terms of you know what you need to do in order to have a good strong immune system. I think skipping dinner two or three times a week, go to bed early makes a huge difference. Um, and certainly waking up, uh, uh, you know, with uh, having been 16, 17, 18 hours without any food in your system, does remarkable things for your immune system. There, they, you know, you talked about hermesis. I mean, uh, being aware of the fact that it's stressing your body a little bit in the right ways, you know, doing a cold plunge, doing a sauna, working out, um, underfeeding, all of these things put your body under good stress and it actually makes you produce healthy immune cells, a robust immune response. It's really good for your brain. So, so you and I just laid out a number of things that are getting too complicated that if you pay attention to and you get behind, you're going to have a really good, robust immune system. You need to become aware of the supplements and nutrients that build a good immune system. And you and I could basically point out, you know, just get, get on really good probiotics now. And that should be central to what you 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 put into your body every day. Fermented foods. I don't deal with uh, dairy all that well. So I have cashew milk yogurt, almond milk yogurt. That's really high in probiotics. And I'll add probiotics that I like into that kind of yogurt. And that'll be a meal for me. Yeah. And I think, I think the, for the listeners, one of the things that's really important is when we're talking about health and well-being, the things I talk about in the podcast, the things I talk about how to fix uh, and improve your health, these are all the same things that Oz is just talking about, you know, diet, nutrition, lifestyle, sleep, respiration, emotional fitness, right? All of these things are key. Obviously, you have to have good metabolic fitness, good microbial fitness, and genetic fitness. But those three things, those last three things are things that you're going to have a harder time assessing and make, maybe making some corrections because that's where things get a little bit more complex. Sure. But the things like exercising appropriately and getting to sleep and good sleep habits and just good lifestyle habits, good respiration, these things done consistently are the things that are going to make you healthier overall and make you put you in a better position to recover your, your health and your well-being. So it doesn't really change too much when you talk to most functional practitioners or holistic practitioners. We're still really focused on trying to get you to change lifestyle factors, dietary factors, you know, to even make it super simple on the nutrition, whole food, real food should be the the basis of your diet, less processed food, super simple, sure. right? It doesn't have to be that complicated. You're probably not finding that stuff in your, in the Burger King drive through And so if you're a person who's eating more packaged processed food while it tastes good, those are things that are probably going to kind of compromise your health. There is a dichotomy to health and that is the more effort you put in, the more work you put in to improving your health, typically the easier your life is. But the person who doesn't put a lot of work and effort into their health, their their health is usually or their their life is usually harder. Um so there is that di dichotomy, you know, the more effort you put in, the easier life is, the less effort you put in, often the harder your life is. So yeah, it, put, it, put the work it, in. It has, it, it has to become routine. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what you and I are talking about, as you and I lay out the, these, the, you know, these, these hot spots, it's, it's, it, it, when you wake up in the morning, you have to have a morning routine. And, and so you get up, you have a tall glass of water first thing because you're dehydrated, you're, you're, you've evaporated a lot of fluid during the night. 
And then, you know, sit down, have a cup of tea. Don't, don't look at your phone first thing in the morning. And, and certainly when you're going to go to bed, you know, you, everything should be turned off. And if you're going to, if you want to look at a film or something, look, it's like, I don't even have a TV set in my, my home anymore. It's crazy. But, but I'll, I'll look at my iPad if I want to look at a, at a film or something. And I, and I put it on, 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 on a nighttime light, right? So that you need to, you need to adjust your phones accordingly so that you're not getting all the yellow light that, that's going to disturb the production of melatonin, et cetera. Stay away from digital devices when you go to bed. And certainly when you get up in the morning, have a cutoff point in that regard. That's a big deal. And and don't don't get so caught up, you know, in doom scrolling because that really screws your brain up. Yeah. So really if it's like 7 a.m. in the morning, you're like having a cup of coffee and, you know, you, I start your phone, you're looking at emails and the blue light is on, you're doom scrolling, you've got an Instagram and all this crap. That That's deadly. It just adds to the load, unfortunately. So and we're going to, this is a good conversation, but we're going to finish this up. Uh, what I, why don't we tell people again, the name of the book, where sure. they can get it and, and where they can, if they want more information on Oz Garcia, where they can go. Uh, the, 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 the latest book, uh, Eric is after COVID optimizing your health in a changing world after COVID it's on Amazon, uh, obviously by me. Oz Garcia. And uh, they can go to my website, ozgarcia.com. Everything is there. They'll find out all about me, my background, our practices, and how they can contact me. Um, um, and, and, and of course, if you go on Amazon, you'll see all the other books that I've written too that may have some relevance for you. Awesome. So I appreciate you coming on the podcast, telling, telling your story, talking a bit about COVID and health and nutrition. Um, and for the listeners, you know, this the, what we talked about with, on this podcast was a bit about COVID and the immune system, but really all the stuff we talked about at the end about the lifestyle factors and nutrition. These are things that are right. beneficial. I don't care what your diagnosis is; doesn't matter what the disease is. Right. These are all things that if you want to have a better health, better quality of life, these are the things to work on. And don't don't be jumping. Don't I know everybody wants to look for the shiny, shiny ob object that's going to save the day. And but they're jumping over the dollar bill to pick up the penny often sure. by looking for that secret strategy that somebody might post is sexy on a blog post. Put a lot. Make sure you put time and effort into the things we talked about today. So, Oz, it was great meeting you. Great having you on the podcast. Right. And yeah, uh, we've been, we, this is great. We just, but we, we haven't stopped talking for an hour and a half. Hour and a half. It's easy when you do it when you're enjoying the conversation. All right. Remarkable. See you soon. Much love. Take care. Thank you.